So now we're in the third and final section of our lectures on distributed energy resources. And this is material that was put together by a past teaching assistant, Leisha's son. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of focus on just talking about examples and windmill, but mostly in OpenDSS, because the OpenDSS is what you're gonna be using for your project part three. And I'll start off with the windmill examples and I'll show you how we can do some of this modeling. You've done a little bit of this before in your homework, in homework eight. And then I want to get into how we use the time series capability of OpenDSS for first looking at cloud cover intermittency analysis. So this is going to be deviations in power flow, which is going to cause deviations in voltage due to cloud cover. And then we'll look at um, some mitigation methods for dealing with this intermittency. The example circuit we'll be looking at, it's, it's kind of similar in nature to the, the circuit you're using for your project. Uh, this is another similar type of a circuit. And what we have, it's a 23 kV circuit. And what we'll initially start looking at, we'll start looking at with the windmill analysis a large scale PV plant on the main feeder and also some smaller plants on the residential side on this lateral. And you note that this PV system, this PV plants located below a regulator, most utilities do not like putting large scale PV below regulators and we'll, you'll see in your project why that's the case in part three. If it's not too large, maybe this will work out okay, but if this is a really large plant, then we'd see some interaction between the PV system and the upstream regulator. And again, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before when we talk about these large scale PV plant, I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, generation systems that are on acres and acres of land. Uh, this shows an example of a five megawatt farm and you obviously see all the solar panels on here. And then basically these panels are put together in series, different series and parallel combinations and tied into inverters. And you can kind of see located on the property, you have these kind of little white rectangles in here. Then these would correspond to where the, the megawatt scale inverters are, are actually at with the pad mount transformers that would actually then tie the, the um, tie the system into the utility. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on this figure, but you can kind of see there's some overhead distribution here. And then basically what you would have is you would have a underground cable system that would be linking all these inverter pads together again. And then this would then tie into the grid. What we're mostly concerned about modeling those, we're mostly concerned about modeling the inverters. And instead of modeling each inverter separately, we usually just model this as one equivalent inverter. So as far as the operating modes, if we're talking about pre-2018 standards, we didn't really have that much flexibility. Most of the time, these PV plants were operating at a unity power factor. So power factor equal to one, there'd be no reactive power injection. However, you did have a few sites that were operating at fixed power factors. Now, why would you want a plant to operate at, at some sort of a fixed power factor? Well, what they would do in some instances is if you had a PV plant, if you were going to get an increase in voltage due to injected power, what you may want to do is actually have that operate at a leading power factor and actually sink reactive power in an effort to kind of drag that voltage down. So basically you counteract the rise in voltage caused by P by a decrease in voltage caused by Q. This way, if you have a plant trip, you don't really have as much um, voltage deviation. But, but anyway, that's usually a special circumstance where you want to have a, a PV plan operate at something other than unity power factor. There have been some cases pre-2018 where a, a PV plant would be involved in voltage control. It would have a set point voltage that it would actually compensate for 
um, by adjusting the reactive power, just kind of like a regular synchronous generator would. But that in the past would have required a special arrangement with the utility in order to do something like that. So a lot of times in the past, these have been more designed just to be unity power factor injection points. So as far as the model for the inverter, inverters are typically rated in terms of the amount of current they can handle. And so if you can take the voltage times the current rating, then that would give you a value in KVA or, or MVA. And what this would mean if you would plot this on a PQ coordinate system, we have real power in the real axis, reactive power in the imaginary axis, that the capability as far as different output conditions would theoretically lie on this circle. Now you're gonna have a physical real power output due to the size of the, the panels, the number of panels you have. And so this real power restriction would be on this vertical curve uh, a lot of time that a lot of times that would be less um, than the power handling capability of the inverter because you would also like to have some ability of absorbing or injecting reactive power. And so in the new 1547 standard, basically, if we talk about high penetration systems that the standard says that you have to be able to operate with the reactive power at 44% of your of your rating in KBA. And so what this means is you would have kind of like an upper Q and a lower Q um, rating as well. And then where you would be operating at is you would be operating somewhere on this curve between the upper Q and the lower Q points. And that's assuming that you're operating at full sun output, right? Obviously, if you don't have enough sun to drive the the full rating of the array that you're going to be operating below, you know, to the left of this line. I'm just saying at full power output, um, you'd be operating somewhere right in right in here. Okay. So anyway, another thing uh, before we we kind of get into the windmill example is just a refresher on the way the bulge regulators would operate. Typically, a utility would have voltage regulators operating in bidirectional mode. What this means is that the direction of power flow changed. Normally, it's from left to right, but if you had like feeder reconfiguration, if you're back feeding a circuit from an alternate source, the power would be flowing through the regulator in the opposite direction. Normally, utilities would have this in bidirectional mode to handle reconfiguration. However, if you have distributed generation and that pushes the net power flow toward the source, then that can actually confuse the regulator. And so you're regulating on the wrong side of the regulator. So this is why utilities would also have controllers, regulator controllers that could operate in cogeneration mode. And basically what cogeneration mode is, it, it turns off bidirectional mode. Um, so this is it's like you almost have, you have like a dumber regulator in a way, and it always regulates on the V2 side, regardless of the power flow, the real power flow. Now, if you did need to have a mechanism for having the regulator change sides that it regulates against, let's suppose you had distributed generation, but you also were maybe doing back feeding for improving reliability. Uh, another sort of capability some of these regulators have would be to change their direction based on reactive power. Because typically distributed generation just pushes real power. It doesn't really push much reactive power. And so this is a something that maybe some utilities might use is they would actually change the bi-directional capability of the regulator by sensing reactive current. Of course, the problem you run into with something like that is if you have a lot of switch capacitors. And so there's no easy answer to this. Um, in windmill, basically the regulators are set up to operate in cogeneration mode. They don't support bidirectional mode. If you had a more sophisticated modeling program, then you could maybe choose a control strategy. But in windmill, it's um, it just simply models everything in cogeneration mode all the time. It doesn't operate in bidirectional mode. So 
Another sort of model that we may want to be using is a um, either a negative load model or a, a swing K bar model. And so if you're not wanting to control the voltage, then you're going to use what's called the negative load model. That basically, if you have a PV, it's just going to model that as a minus P and a minus Q as far as the load flow algorithm is concerned. However, if you have a circumstance where you want to control the voltage, then you would use this other model in windmill that they refer to as a swing K bar. And what you do is you set a set point for the voltage. And then given you have a certain output power you're trying to maintain, if you give it a maximum and minimum Q value, what it'll do is it'll adjust the reactive power until you hit the set point. And then of course, if you hit a limit, then you just kind of operate it at a fixed P and Q. But if you haven't hit the Q limit, then you could actually regulate the voltage. So, so again, the swing K bar is, is the method that we've used typically with synchronous generators on a transmission grid. And this shows right here, if we were going to run a, a analysis on this 23 kV circuit, we we're going to do a voltage profile going down the feeder, what the voltage profile would look like. And so if I didn't have PV, the, the voltage would drop, 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 drop. We get to a certain point where the voltage gets too low. We decide we need a regulator and the regulator boosts it back up. And then as we go down the feeder, it drops off again. Now, the reason it doesn't drop off as much after we get past the regulator, there isn't as much load. All your loads at the top of the feeder. And so you get a pretty drastic voltage drop at the top of the feeder. Uh, and then when you get down toward the end, once you get it boosted up, there's not that much load to cause voltage drop anymore. And so it, it usually varies more gradually. Now, if you put PV in the circuit, what this reverse power flow does is it causes a boost in the voltage. The P reacts with the resistance of the lines. And so we see is in blue that this voltage profile is gonna go up. And even though the regulator is regulating the voltage to the same point, because of the fact that we're back feeding P means we're gonna get more voltage boost. This is a relatively small facility for 23 kV, but if we were gonna increase this, then that blue line would go up even higher. And then what we would be worried about, does it actually gonna exceed our ANSI limit of 126 volts? So the thing we're also worried about is we're also worried about voltage deviation due to intermittency. So if we have cloud cover, what this does is it causes the power output of the PV system to vary. And so this is some, um, shows some um, power measurements actually taken at a site. And you can see that we have full sun, then we, you know, we hit around 900 kilowatts or so. But because of cloud cover, what happens is that the output rolls off and then actually it gets as low at, as 165.6, all right? So it drops down quite a bit from 908 to 156.6. And basically the, the time associated with this is, is it's pretty short, right? So what would happen is that when the clouds overhead, then it would stay at this lower value. And then as soon as the clouds rolled, rolled past the, or the ray was located, then the real power would go back up. So one thing to keep in mind is this is not kind of like a square um, event. You'll notice that there's kind of a downward ramp rate and an upward ramp rate. The amount of this ramp rate depends on the size of the ray. And so obviously the larger the array is with respect to the clouds rolling overhead, um, the longer it'll take for this, this power output to drop back down. If you had a smaller array, this would drop off pretty quick. Uh, and so what you'll note, it has kind of like a trough effect, you know, kind of looks like a animal feed trough where it kind of drops down at a slope, it bottoms out and then comes back up at another slope. So if you were going to do a sensitivity analysis and you didn't have any real data, this would probably be a decent model to use as you assume that you have some sort of downward ramp rate and upward ramp rate, and then you can model the response of the system um, due to something like this. So 
this, this is what we refer to as intermittency analysis when we're looking at the impact of this cloud cover. And the thing we got to take into account on this is that regulators would have a time delay. And a lot of times, like a downstream regulator, it's going to have maybe 15, 30, 45, 60 second delay with respect to the substation cap changer. And it could be that um, the regulator is not going to be able to react to this cloud cover intermittency. It happens so fast. And so the way we model that in program like Windmill is we'll go ahead and we'll run a case. Like say if we're looking at ramp up, we'll have no PV in the case. We'll do a voltage drop run. We'll set this up where when we run the power flow, we work off the previous results. And when we do the run with no PV, we have the regulators on. If you want it, a lot of times you'll run this in infinite tap mode, but if you wanted to make it discrete, you can make it discrete as well. And then uh, we would run it with the regulators working the PV off. And then what we would do is we run a second case based on the first case. And what we would do then is we would turn the PV on, we would lock the regulators and we'd rerun the voltage drop study. And what this will show us is it show us the difference in the voltages, given that this regulator can't react. And then if you want to look at like a, a, a downward ramp, then we, we'd run the study with the PV on, we'd have the regulators working, and then we go ahead and lock the regulators. In other words, we turn it off, we turn the um, PV off, and then we would basically see what's going to happen when we get a very fast drop in the output. So again, you have to look for some mechanism in here for locking the regulator. Now, when we do this in OpenDSS, we don't have to worry about this because if we're running in quasi-static study mode in OpenDSS, we actually are modeling the delay that we would have with the operation of the regulators. And so then we don't need to do this sort of thing. This is just something you have to do if you're doing snapshot analysis. So this kind of shows the same profile again. And this is the case where we're going from a no PV to PV case. And so this is showing the ramp up. Um, and what you would see in this case with no PV, you'd have your original voltage profile when we turn the PV on. Then what happens is this voltage instantaneously jumps up. And because the regulator can't react, even at the point we have the regulator, we still see the voltage rise. And so this change, what we would be looking for is we'd be looking for this worst case voltage change. And what we'd be looking at is what's the percent change in this voltage? What's the delta with respect to nominal voltage? And this is where we would look to see if this is going above our restriction. Um, you know, a lot of utilities would maybe use numbers like 2 to 2.5% or 3%. Um, and basically, the larger this PV plan is, the more this change is going to be. The other thing that's going to impact this change is what's the electrical distance between the substation and the PV. So the longer that'll longer that electrical distance, the more change is going to be. So it's a function of two things, basically. It's going to be a function of what's the size of this PV plant, then also how much resistance is out there going all the way back up to the equivalent source for the circuit, all right? So depending on those two numbers, the larger the size of the plant, the more the impedance, the more deviation in bulbs we're going to see. And we need to make sure it doesn't go over our, our upper limit. You can also look at this going the other way. Um, you would think this might be symmetric, but it may not be symmetric because you know the, the way the regulators would actually be set up and where the original tap position was and things like that. Um, so anyway, what you have in this case, if you're going from the PV case to the no PV case, this is the ramp down case. Then you can see with PV that the bulge would start off kind of high. And then what happens when we lose the PV plant, the regulators are locked. And again, this voltage drops down 
And again, we're looking at this percent change in voltage with respect to nominal and whether that's going to be over our limit of say two, 2.5 or 3%. When you're modeling the smaller, um, say like the residential PV systems, like the rooftop residential systems, uh, you, you could do this one of two ways. One would be that you could just model the load as load, and then you could model this using a, a generator model. So in this case, if you had like a three kilowatt system, you could actually just put a negative load generator in your, in your model. Um, I would probably say that a lot of utilities want to go through all this trouble of in their um, computer model of putting all these little small generators in there. I mean, they could do that, but probably what a lot of utilities are going to be doing with residential PV is they're probably going to have this set up for net metering. What this means is that the PV is on the customer side of the meter, and they don't really keep tabs of exactly how much that PV generates. They just, they're just concerned about net load. So another way you could do this, if you, you could put a load model in here and you just take the load and you subtract off the, the PV and then you just go ahead and enter that in. And this just simply becomes a net load where it's load plus PV. Um, and so if, again, we, the utilities may not have direct metering on all these small kilowatt systems. It maybe costs too much to do that. And so if they're doing like, say, like net metering, then you would just go ahead and maybe put in the, the net value. And the, and the problem you run into then with this, if you just have like kilowatt hour billing um, data from all these net metering customers, then if you're doing modeling, you're trying to figure out, well, what's going to be the load shapes and things like that. Then you have to kind of work the, you know, what's the solar part of that into your modeling equations. And so it makes it a little bit tricky to do analytics on this, but, but utilities can do that. So anyway, here's just shows like a residential modeling scenario. And th this actually shows using both methods. So again, you could either use a separate generator model and include this in your windmill analysis, or what you can do is you can just simply net the load and the PV together and then come up with the number. Uh, keep in mind what you're usually going to be looking at when you're doing these snapshot cases, you're normally going to be looking at worst case scenarios. And so if this is like a summer day, this is likely going to be a late afternoon. Um, it's probably not going to be a time where you have peak PV. Or if it's winter, it's likely to be early in the morning, say like 8 a.m., where you're not going to have much PV. Where the PV would be more important to model would be a corner case, like you have a spring or fall day with light load. And then you're looking at a noontime situation where you have full sun and you have a lot of power flowing back into the grid. And so this is, a, the PV studies are a little bit different in that we look at different times of the day than we would if we would have no PV at all, because we're looking at the worst case impact of the distributed generation in that case. And from a system impact, that a lot of times happens under light load conditions. So what I'll do in the, in the next video then, I will start uh, going into OpenDSS and we're in the previous lecture on OpenDSS, I just did the snapshots. Now what we're gonna do is look what it takes to set this up for the time series analysis.